Hello, this is James Cook of the University of Maine at Augusta, and I'm recording this video for the Social Science Senior Project Capstone, SSC 420. If you're in my class, you know that uh, we had technical difficulties due to uh, central failure within the University of Maine video conferencing system. However, that issue has been resolved for future weeks, and uh, we should not encounter that problem again. For this week, uh, what that means is that I'm re-recording uh, the course lecture for those of you who need to review it after the fact. And in addition, because that's taking an extra day out of your work time subsequent to the course lecture, uh, I'm adding one day of extension uh, for that lost day and an additional day for the trouble that you might have in uh, shifting your schedule in order to uh, have extra time to complete the assignment. Let's talk today about uh, a few issues to get the course started well. We're going to start off with the course orientation. Then I'm going to describe uh, the process of asking a research question uh, and thinking about what the motivations are for uh, finding a research question that works for you that leads into a research method working for you. That has to do with our uh, big course project, which is a uh, research uh, project completed that involves empirical social science research work. Then we'll be talking about choosing a feasible research design, not just a solid research design that could hypothetically work, but one that will work within the time frame of this semester. Then I want to give you a, a peek at some of the research that I'm currently doing that uh, I have started from the uh, point of a simple topic, moving on to a research question, moving on to a protocol for collecting data. And uh, I want to show you how that is progressing and what my thought process has been and how that thought process uh, is converted into a research process that is visible through uh, an online database. And then we'll talk about the first round of work that is due now on January 29th uh, that will get you started on the path to a successfully completed semester, a successfully completed degree, uh, and a consolidated research skill for however you're going to move forward. So in this course orientation, uh, which is the first part of this lecture, I want to talk about how our classes are going to work. Uh, and then I'd, I'd like to talk about the work that you're going to do. This is an unusual class in that we have a video conference uh, for a seminar, but we also have individuals uh, because of university policy who are uh, asynchronously connecting. This means that uh, I can't really require that you attend the weekly course meetings by university policy and through principles of equity. I don't want to require those meetings for some students, but not for others. So they're optional, these Thursday 1 to 345 meetings. However, they are really highly recommended because it is the chance for you and I to connect in real time to interact in real time to have a back and forth of questions, answers, uh, questions going back to you, your response, and then feedback as we adjust until we are at a point of joint understanding. We can do some of that over email and I'd be glad to do some of that over the phone, but there's nothing like in real time, face to face, seeing some kind of connection. Um, as you know, through the course syllabus. It's um, possible for you to connect in two ways. One is through attending one of the uh, three video conference uh, rooms that are reserved for us. And the second is on the second page under course meetings through a Zoom link. You can use Zoom through an iPad, a smartphone, a tablet, uh, a PC computer, uh, any number of possibilities. It's uh, free software to you, so it doesn't cost anything. 
and that will be a second mode through which we are open for connection. Um, you're also welcome to consult with me during office hours. I'm at the University of Maine at Augusta Rockland Center uh, on Thursdays from 8 to 9 and noon to 1. And also, um, I have office hours on Mondays from noon to 4. It'll be at a different campus each week, so I can uh, better get in touch with folks from different parts of the state. Um, I'll announce what those are in advance. But I'll also, at those times, always be available by phone, uh, and we can do uh, a video meeting, just one-on-one -on -one as well, no matter where you are, uh, in Maine or in the world. Uh, if you'd like to consult with me one-on-one -on -one and arrange a meeting at a time that works for both of us, uh, please do get in touch with me. My phone number is 621-3190, and my email address is james.m.cook at Maine. Edu. The last way we can uh, be in touch is, uh, of course, through the Blackboard page. That's where you'll be uploading your work. And um, also, you can use the Blackboard system to send me messages. I'll be sending you announcements. You should be checking your email on a regular basis, I would suggest daily, um, in order to make sure that we are on the same page, uh, especially when there are circumstances like uh, what happened with our first course meeting that are unavoidable but create difficulties that we then need to work around. Uh, so um, this is uh, a course in which we have two texts with two purposes. One which is past facing. This uh, Russell Shutt, Investigating the Social World, 7th edition uh, textbook, it is uh, one that I chose because I know it is for the most recent incarnation of SSC 320, the prerequisite for this class. It is the textbook that was used in the last uh, session of that. So most of you, if you're coming directly from SSC 320, will have already read through and worked through this book. And this book is here for reference. We are going to review and reprise some of that, um, some of the skills and some of the knowledge that you obtained there. Uh, but uh, we're going to do so quickly at a fast pace. If you have took uh, SSC 320 in years past, you should know that this is very similar to, say, the uh, Earl Babby uh, textbook that was used before then. So it should all be review. These are our skills and pieces of knowledge that you should already have, uh, but we're going to reprise them because it never hurts to practice and nail them down, especially for those of you who might have taken a year or two uh, in between 320 and 420. So we'll work with that, but this should be new for everyone. It's a really handy dandy thin book <laughs> with small pages. It has pictures, but it concerns um, a really daunting uh, seeming task, which is understanding regression analysis. That sounds intimidating, doesn't it? But um, multiple regression is really just about the old geometry of working with the equation for a line. Uh, a line in two axes that describes how change in one axis leads to change in another, right? Which, if you remember your shut or your babby, is all about how an independent variable affects a dependent variable. Uh, multiple regression analysis, which we'll get to, allows you to consider the impact of multiple variables at the same time on a dependent variable. Uh, I can tell you it's a statistical procedure, which might produce anxiety, but I can uh, also describe this in a way which should alleviate anxiety, which is that the interpretation of multiple regression analysis results, at least the um, constant and the slopes, is a matter of simple addition, subtraction, and multiplication. If you can add numbers, subtract numbers, and divide numbers, or, or, or multiply them, because multiplication and division are the same thing, then you can work with multiple regression. And uh, this is a really nice book. Uh, it's compact, and you'll need to take time to read it, but it will really level you up. If you can understand multiple regression by the end of this course, boy, I promise, if you have a professional job, you'll find a time in your life where you'll need to use some kind of regression level thinking. So those are the texts. And then we have uh, uh, some work that you need to do. One piece of that work is just as we move from the past to the present, so you can move to your future, 
we have a personal academic narrative that I want you to complete. It's 20% of your grade, and it's about roughly 20 pages. What I want you to do is to take your um, academic work and to summarize the skills and the knowledge that you have obtained that is relevant to you from all your academic coursework uh, to achieve a BA in social science to date. I'd like you to um, summarize that in a CV or a resume. I'd like you to tell me then the story uh, that tells me where you are now. Tell me then the story of your future, what you're going to do with this preparation, with your current capabilities, and uh, how that will move you into the future, either as a non-academic professional or perhaps in future academic work, uh, graduate school, which is when it really gets fun. Uh, so that's going to be due at the end of the semester, and it's worth 20% of your grade. You're also going to do a research paper, an original empirical research paper. So in addition, you're going to do a research presentation. It's going to be at the Student Academic Research Conference, which happens every spring at the University of Maine at Augusta. Uh, it's going to be awesome. And a few of you are saying, wait a minute, I don't live in Maine. That doesn't matter because at this student academic research conference, we have the option of modalities that are asynchronous and online. You may present by video. Everybody is going to present um, from this class. It is 10% uh, of your final grade. You'll be presenting your research paper. Uh, and doing so, preparing for that is a really great check for you as you get your final research paper ready. <laughs> it's a really good motivation um, and it's good practice too. Uh, and then finally, you're gonna have weekly homework. We'll talk about this week's homework, which is due January 29th, um, but I, I hope you notice that when you do that homework, it's not just make work. We're not just doing it so that you can have some work to do. Each time you do that work, it is helping you put together a piece for your final research paper so that this empirical research paper, this big sounding project, is divided up into a series of steps. A big project is scary, small steps, they can be achieved. You can do them. Uh, if you've done well in your coursework, and you shouldn't be here unless you have, then you really should be prepared to take each one of those individual steps with a little bit of guidance, uh, a, a fair amount of feedback, uh, you should be able to do it. Uh, and you may surprise yourself in the extent to which you really are prepared for that step. So if you can do those things and take an exam halfway through finally the uh, semester, which will be a motivation for you to do uh, that consolidation of the knowledge you should already have and the skills you should already have, reviewing it again, making sure that you're, you're ready to nail those concerns, then you'll be fine in this capstone. And I hope that you will have, between the beginning of the semester and the end of the semester, really transformed, not just in terms of what skills uh, and knowledge you have, but in terms of their applicability, that you'll know how to use them, how to put them into effect in the world. And to the extent that your own personal identity is connected to what it is that you're able to do, I'm hoping that you will see in yourself a personal transformation, that you will think of yourself in a really new and different way by the end of the semester. That's my hope. That's the journey I want to take you on. And um, I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, it can be a very special course uh, that, that students go through right at the end of their academic career. It's a good time uh, now that you've elevated yourself to have this summit experience where you turn around and you look down that mountain and you see how far you've come and you see the peak just a little bit above you. So let's move on now to the idea, which is in this week's reading that you should have completed, um, but also one that you've considered before, which is asking a research question. It's connected to your research paper and it's connected to your homework for this week, uh, in which I'm asking you to take a topic and turn that into 
a social science research question. Now, in asking a question, you know, you may be asking yourself, well, what kind of project am I going to do? I have no ideas. I'm, I'm out of ideas. The motivations for asking a research question can be multiple. One of them is your own life. If you remember your Sociology 101 class, uh, you should have had some reference to C. Wright Mills, and certainly also in the Social Problems course, 201. In those courses, we review C. Wright Mills and his idea that we go through life um, with the experience of having personal troubles, and that's because we live in our own heads. So of course we're going to think of them personally. Maybe they're money troubles. Maybe they're interpersonal troubles. Maybe they're struggles to get enough resources. All kinds of personal troubles people can have. But the sociological imagination, as C. Wright Mills calls it, and that's the title of his book, in 1959, uh, the, the sociological imagination consists of taking that personal trouble and then elevating your view up higher so that you can notice that your personal trouble, this thing that you think is due to you, a problem in just your life, is actually perhaps part of a pattern. And that is a classic undergraduate journey that I hope you have taken uh, from the 100, 200, 300, and now 400 level to gain the skills through research to uh, elevate your view, be able to look beyond your own skin, your own skull, and to be able to have a broader view, a systematic view, a careful view that allows you to evaluate the extent to which these personal troubles might be social issues. So if you go back through your own life and you think about struggles that you have had as a person, think about how they can be viewed using your sociological imagination from a social uh, standpoint. And that may be your research question. Uh, you also might want to have some personal ambition. Maybe you have a job in mind. Maybe you have a professional goal. Uh, maybe you want to get into a certain graduate school with a certain topic. Well, why not do a research paper in that topic? Because to do so would demonstrate that you have uh, the ability to, to produce new knowledge regarding that subject and that you have the skills to be able to tackle problems uh, adroitly uh, that might emerge in that uh, either professional or academic environment. It'll show that you've got the chops and that you have something to offer either uh, your employer or uh, the folks at the new school that you want to go to. So you can satisfy your personal ambition that way. A student uh, in the 420 course last year uh, wanted to move on into mortuary science and work at a funeral home and get a really good job there. And she used um, the SSC 420 class to do a research project which demonstrated the scope of the problems uh, and capacities of the funeral industry in the state of Maine. Uh, and with that work, she gained new insights that she was able to use to really tailor her job application. So that's personal ambition. There's also social impact. You may want to make the world a better place, and you may have some ideas about how the world is not quite what it could be. Pay attention to that. Think about those topics and use that possibly as a motivation to uh, ask a research question, to understand things better, because if you understand how the social world works better, you can uh, solve the problems because you, you, you can't fix things if you don't know what's broken and you don't know how they're broken. A fourth motivation for you in terms of asking a research question is uh, in terms of the extension of prior research. This is an incremental approach. But um, if you have taken classes in which you have read through the research literature on a subject, perhaps the sociology of gender or the sociology of uh, stratification or uh, the psychology of climate change, there are many uh, uh, psychology of men and boys, of evil and humor, many, many classes in which you might have 
review the academic literature on a subject. Think back to those courses. Think back to a time when you've done a literature review. Oh, in SSC 320 you should have, and in SSC 220, if you took it, uh, you should have. You think about the moment at which you reviewed the literature and you said, is that all? Is that it? I can't believe there isn't a piece of research on this subject or that subject, or why haven't they extended the uh, uh, research to this domain or that domain or this place or that place? Or why is it that the last piece of research to ask this question is 40 years old? Isn't it time for an update? <laughs> well, okay, if it's time for an update, maybe you're the one to do it. If that all these research questions, um, research papers have not tackled this particular subtopic, maybe you're the one to do it. Um, you could be ready. Uh, finally, um, curiosity. So there's something that's always just tickled your mind. Maybe it doesn't impact you. Maybe it doesn't make the world a better place. Maybe you don't know anything about it right now. Maybe it won't help you get a job, but it's always something that's just made you go, hmm, made you wonder, made you think. Um, there's nothing like that kind of experience of curiosity to push forward a research paper. For all of these motivations, there is one common denominator, and that is that it should be something that somehow connects to your interest. Because if you are not interested in a research topic, and yet you're having to do it, Boy, that will be, mm, it might be boring, it might be dull, it might just make you feel kind of rotten and gray. On the other hand, if you have some reason you're doing something, or some interest, something that connects to your experience, or the experience of people you care about, or a logical problem that's always just made you curious, well, what better motivator is there to do the hard work in the middle of a research project to pull it all together? Think about these motivations if you are asking yourself, what kind of research question might I possibly have? What topic might I have before that? Okay, think about that when you're coming up with a research question. Another question, though, that you'll have to tackle is, can I do this within one semester's time? Because if you can't, then you should not do it. There are limitations. You have to finish this by the first week of May, or second week of May, I believe. Um, and that's not too long in the future. Now, you have more skills and more knowledge about this than you think you do. So you definitely can do a research uh, project, but you can't just do any research project. Are you going to have access to the information that you will need to complete your original research project? Uh, if the answer is no, if it, maybe the information is locked away and you need to engage in months and months of negotiation in order with some institution in order to get that information, then you're out of luck. It's not going to work. If uh, you want to do a nationally representative survey of the United States population, do you have access to a sampling frame, which is a set of all the phone numbers in the United States uh, from which you can do a random sample, uh, for instance? If you don't, then you can't do it. Um, and if you're not going to do uh, a representative sample, by the way, for something like a survey or some other uh, study, then... It, it, well, it needs to be representative. Otherwise, it's not a good research proposal. So there are many ways in which a survey uh, may not be the right option for you for this course. If you want to go on to graduate school and you want to go into survey research, go to the University of Michigan. They've got a great master's program for that. Um, that's super. Uh, and you can find out how to do that and you can gain access to all kinds of sources to be able to do that. If you want to go into uh, political science, go to Quinnipiac University. They have a whole polling uh, uh, apparatus there, which is wonderful, but you don't have that access yet. But do you have time to do this research? Ask yourself when you're thinking about research designs, am I going to be able to complete all the necessary steps in order to accomplish that work? Now, one of the big steps that is sometimes required 
as you've already read in whatever your SSC 320 text was, and we will be considering this in a few weeks in the future. I, I think it is uh, the week of February 3rd through the 9th, is ethics review uh, through the Institutional Review Board of the University of Maine, or whatever university you will be working with in the future if you do. If it involves human subjects and it's sensitive research, it's not already publicly available data, or uh, data that is public and you could turn in, in, into a data set somehow, if it's not publicly available and um, it involves human subjects and it's really sensitive research, like say you want to interview sex workers or uh, children who have been sexually abused, think about it. Um, going through an intense IRB application process in which you're gonna have to put together an application and then they'll do initial review, and then they'll communicate back with you, and then you'll have to uh, complete a response answering their questions, and then they will either approve your project or not. How many weeks is that going to take up? Or possibly months? How much time does then that leave you to complete your research? Think about that really, really carefully. Are you going to want to interview torture victims? Uh, or people who are politically threatened uh, by an authoritarian regime. Uh, if so, that's going to invoke the uh, Institutional Review Board process, as you should know from 320. Um, and that's going to take a lot of time. On the other hand, there's expedited review when, uh, if you go through some flowcharts, and I'm going to ask you to do that, we have a, a, a homework assignment called Follow the Flow, uh, and you can avoid uh, a thorough review and instead get an expedited review, well, then you're in luck. You can move forward very quickly with your research. Isn't that great? Um, think about that. There's also money. Are you going to be interviewing people in Colorado about their experience uh, in the rec uh, recreational marijuana market? Well, how are you going to get to Colorado? Uh, and, you know, how are you going to drive around? Do you have the funds? Do you have the resources? If you don't, well, then maybe that research design is not feasible. I hate to, you know, break dreams, but those kinds of uh, access problem, uh, time problem, money problem, uh, research projects are really best done either in graduate school where you have access to um, faculty members who can arrange funds and an institution that will support you because that's part of what graduate school is and why it's so cool. Or if you become a professor like me and you can apply for grants, uh, which takes a long time, but then you have the time as a professor to do that because you don't just have a semester in order to make sure it's done. Make sure that design is feasible because if it's not feasible, then your semester will not be feasible and your graduation will not be feasible. And we don't want that. So think about feasibility. Can you do it? And we will work on this together, but keep that in mind as you get started. All right. So I want to let you know, uh, give you an idea about what research can look like. Um, and I would like to show you uh, the experience of working through a couple of examples in that regard. Real research that I'm doing right now. Uh, and so one of them uh, has to do with uh, the experience of being a social media researcher and a political sociologist. So this is previous research I've already done. If you look me up online at uma.edu, you can find a series of publications that I have in research that show that I, I do research in social media and in politics, and sometimes both. And one of the things I've been doing in recent years is looking at state legislatures, which are really interesting because, first of all, their behavior is public. Second, um, the people who participate in them are politicians. They're public figures. Their lives and communications are out on the on. Uh, on display for everyone. And third, there's a particular platform in which there are public communications that are made, often by politicians, even at the state level and at this local level of a, a local district, your local state senator or representative. And that's social media, particularly Twitter, where all communications are made public. And so I have been collecting that information. Who are 
the state legislators? What are their social media accounts? And then what kind of patterns of communication do they have between them? Uh, and what predicts them? What are the independent variables predicting patterns of communication? So I was doing that last semester, like you do. And then all of a sudden, a historical event came along. Uh, and that was the nomination of Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court. And uh, when that came along, uh, by golly, uh, it was riveting. I imagine you probably remember the nomination of Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court. You probably uh, know some people who were involved in conversation about it, particularly when allegations of sexual assault were brought to bear the nation's eyes to turn to it. Uh, perhaps you were involved in those conversations yourself. I realized at that moment that I had a really interesting uh, lens through which I was recording at that moment by collecting the tweets of state legislatures, uh, state legislators. I, I had this lens and this, 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 this tool that allowed me to look at how these local level politicians are, we're looking at um, the uh, Kavanaugh nomination, how they were connected through party because most members of state legislatures are uh, partisan, Democrats or Republicans, occasionally Greens, every once in a while an independent. Um, so they were interested because this was uh, a party related activity, but they also had gender and there were gendered issues that were brought up during this nomination that were highly salient. So that moment led to a combination of the factors that lead to a research question and a topic, right? So there was the availability. Um, there was previous research that I'd done. I found the uh, events personally to be quite evocative and uh, uh, they grabbed my attention. And um, I realized that I might have the ability to change the understanding or discussion of how people considered the Brett Kavanaugh Supreme Court nomination by looking at how uh, politicians across the country were talking about it. It led to these questions that were coming up in my mind as I slept, like if we think about simultaneously party and gender and we place them side by side, um, which one is invoked for a state legislator in terms of their position? Wow. So, uh, you know, so if you are a woman versus a man, uh, and you, if you are a Republican versus a Democrat, there are four possible combinations, right? Uh, men, Democrats, women, Democrats, men, Republicans, women, Republicans. What's the pattern of support look like for those four categories? And what does that say about the importance of political party in determining position versus a person's gender. Maybe actually there's no pattern in which we go, wow, gender and party didn't matter at all. Well, that would be interesting too. Something called a null hypothesis, but there's something to look at there um, because there were a lot of claims made discursively during that time, meaning that uh, regarding the discussion during that time about, oh, women and oh, men, and oh, Democrats, and oh, Republicans, and what they're doing and what they're thinking has these kind of like categorical claims about what people in certain social categories do or say or believe or think or don't think. So I realized I could test that. What a privilege to be able to do that. Um, I also realized I could look over time and I could answer even a more fundamental question, which is what is politics for? Uh, okay, so how do I operationalize that? Operationalization, it's in here. Remember that word? It's how you make something, this idea of what is politics for. How do you, how do you convert that to uh, a way of thinking about things that can be very clearly measured uh, systematically, put into operation? That's what operationalization is. Well, I realized I had not just these Twitter posts that state legislators were making, possibly about Brett Kavanaugh, but that the same people could make different posts over time. And I could ask the question, um, does anyone change their mind? If someone does change their mind, 
then what does that say about with their category, right, of party or gender uh, not changing? What does that say about the importance of those categories uh, versus people being able to change their mind based on what happens? Well, that would indicate that politics is this arena in which people come in with open minds and they're able to take new information in and change their minds. On the other hand, there's this vision of politics that says, nah, it's not about changing people's minds. It's about people coming in knowing what they believe and being firm in what they believe and sticking with what they believe and trying to get their way. Uh, these people trying to get their way, those people trying to get their way, those people over here trying to get their way, and everybody jockeying for advantage. That's a very different model of politics than one that says politics is a discussion, a civic discussion. I can see if anybody changes their minds. If so, when? How? In what direction? Does it only happen in one direction? Does it happen in another direction? It, my point is, is that sometimes when you're in the middle of uh, working on a subject. Maybe you've been studying a subject for uh, a couple of semesters now as a relatively advanced uh, uh, bachelor's degree student, and you have some skills and knowledge regarding that particular subject. Uh, you can use that in your research. Maybe you already know where some information is. Maybe because of your skills and knowledge, you have access to information that few other people do. That's really cool. And that experience happened to me this year. I want to share uh, the opening round of what the research process looks like, that is coming up with an idea and a project regarding another project, which is community gardens. You may know that I teach SSC uh, 334. It's called Cultivating Community, the Garden Seminar, the 300 level social science course. And it is nominally speaking, about uh, putting together a community garden. Uh, we have a 9,000 square foot community garden on the Augusta campus. It grows vegetables um, and those vegetables are fresh and organic and healthy and they go to the Augusta Food Bank. Many hundreds of pounds of them every year. So it's a, it's a, it's a civic project that uh, does good things for people who need a little bit of help. But on top of that, it's also a community organizing project because getting a 9,000 square foot community garden uh, going every year and having it work every year is not the work of one person or two people or three people. It's the work of many people working together and that can be hard work. So how do you get a community to come together and do this big project and make it work? Well, that is the subject of community organizing, right? And to do so on a college campus allows you to teach principles of social organizing and recruitment and commitment, uh, motivation, leadership, development, all these academic questions that also are professionally uh, useful uh, for many fields of work. I love it. You could see the look on my face. I love being involved in that garden. As a teacher, I'm the advisor for the Community Garden Club at the University of Maine at Augusta's Augusta campus. I teach this course. So it's really cool. And you could see me walking around campus lots of times, especially in the summer, and I'll be there with enthusiasm. And occasionally I run into a few people at the university who say, what's the point? Why is there a community garden on the university campus? You know, what does that have to do with learning? And my response has always been, isn't it obvious? And I will then hold forth for half an hour uh, because I'm a talky person. But I stopped at one point and I realized, you know, I actually don't know uh, if it's obvious. And there's a prior question, which is, you know, are we the only people who are doing this? I did some looking here and there, and I found a few other examples of community gardens on university campuses, but I thought, you know, I really don't systematically know the answer. And my own answer might be quite biased. So I thought, hey, I'm a researcher. <laughs> I have training. Maybe I'll look into it. This is this very personal, uh, professional personal, but personal interest that I have in this project. And I would like to be able to um, demonstrate or at least describe how common these things are. And if so, at other universities, then I thought, 
hmm, how do they work? So what I decided to do was to take a look at every state university in the United States. And there were a couple of uh, undergraduate students who were really interested in the garden too, who are really smart people. And I said, would you like to work with me on this? And they said, sure. So what we're doing right now is we are, are creating a data set in which we look at every state university in the United States. We are looking at their website and we are looking at their primary Facebook page for evidence of the existence of a community garden on that state university or, or state college um, uh, campus. We're gonna go through all 712 of them. We're gonna document evidence for the existence of such a community garden, at least in the public presentation on the internet of these state universities. And then we will have a census, right? It turns out nobody knows in the whole history of the universe this particular fact. And we're going to create this information. At the same time, we're going to create this product, which is for everybody else who is involved in uh, community gardens, at state universities and colleges like me, uh, the ability to find out who else is doing this. Because the next thing we're going to do is we're going to try to find some contact information, get a contact person, and then we'll try to contact them and say, hey, how are you doing this? How is it working out? Is it succeeded? Did the, oh, did the garden shut down? Or is it continuing to go? How do you do it? Do you, do you have a budget? Do you have someone hired to do that work? Is there a club that does it? What's the club's name? You know, are they associated with a particular student group? Or what does that look like? And we'll find out. And then we'll be able to share that information with others. Sharing that information with others for their various purposes helps community gardens grow, which is cool. I would love that. Uh, it would also help me to be able to talk to my own uh, university administration and to place what I'm trying to do within context. Now, if it turns out I'm the only one doing this, then the kind of discussion I would have with them uh, is going to be very different than if, say, 60% of state universities and colleges around the country are engaging in some form of community gardening on their campus, because that sounds fairly standard and something that uh, a good university would just want to do. This is how my own uh, interests um, and my own experience as a professional Sometimes as a researcher, sometimes as someone who is a teacher, sometimes just as a human being, have motivated my own research. And I hope that by describing that uh, experience, and I'll, I'll, through the semester, show you what the data looks like for these two projects, so you can see what data structure looks like, so you can see what an analysis process looks like. I'll share with you um, uh, conference papers so that you can see then what uh, 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 that process looks like. Um, I, I hope this provides some inspiration to you. you. You might be able to think about things in your own life as you move to what we're going to do next, which is the first round of work. It's an extended deadline, January 29th. You can do um, one of three things. You can, if you've completed a, a research proposal for work that you're going to do, and that research proposal is feasible, that is, you can actually do it in a semester, turn that research proposal in to me. Let me read it. Let me see it. Review it. And I will give you feedback about it uh, in the next class. Or maybe you've actually already completed a full research project. And... You can't just turn that in for credit in this capstone course, nope, 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 but maybe you want to extend it somehow with a new round of research or a new research question that moves on from that old research question. Great! Give me that and I'll read it and I'll give you feedback on your ideas for where you want to go next, which you should also include in our next class. Or maybe you don't really have a good research proposal. Uh, or one that you don't think is feasible, or you, know, you don't have a research project that you've completed, or the one that you did, and it's really done, or you really couldn't move it forward. Fine, come up with a new idea. Uh, what I would like to see in that regard, then, is a minimum of a description of a topic of interest and a description of a research problem leading to a research question, okay? Some question that you can answer through research. And, you know, there's discussion of research questions. 
research problems and approaches in your shut book, chapters one and two, and you should already have talked about that in your research methods classes. If you want to really impress me, start to talk about the method that you think you might use in order to get that research project done. The more you give me, the more feedback I can give you in our next class meeting. As you're doing this, you may be thinking to yourself, boy, this is a lot of work. Yeah, it is. Um, this is a job. This is the equivalent of a, a bit more than a quarter time job. Uh, if you look at um, uh, NEASC, which is our regional accreditor for a university, they state that if you have a four credit hour class, that means 12 solid hours of work every week. So. Uh, this is work that you're going to be putting in 12 hours a week uh, for some weeks a little bit more, some weeks a little bit less, but that's what it should average out to. And if you put in 12 hours a week of really solid, serious work, uh, then you will be able to complete this project uh, using the skills and knowledge that you've already gained, consolidating them with a little bit of a review, consulting with me in office hours in class if you are able to come to those video session meetings in the submissions that you give, in the feedback that you get back from me. You can do this. You totally can do this. You would not be here if you didn't have the chops. We will sharpen up those chops a little bit. We will hone them. We will apply them to a research question that you care about, that you have a motivation uh, to, answer, uh, in, in, to answer your research question. And we'll get you to the end of the semester. And if it all works out and you put in the work and I put in the work, you will be really amazed at what you can do. Uh, and I will be so proud of the work that you've done. So that is uh, a consolidated, uh, re recorded version of the uh, first week's lecture that I offered to the class. And then we did not have anyone come to the uh, video conference or Zoom meeting. Uh, so we were not able to have discussion, which was the second half of class. Um, and, and that's a bit unfortunate, but we can have those discussions in one of two ways, email um, uh, or if you uh, come into class next week if you're able. Uh, if you're not able, uh, there are other ways to communicate with me, and I certainly hope you do. I hope you have, at this point uh, in the semester, after hearing this, a few ideas bubbling up, buzzing inside you. Uh, if you don't yet, do some work thinking about those motivations that we discussed a little bit earlier in the lecture for research. Go back, mind your life mine your experiences, mine your capability, mine your prior work, the research work you've already done, the literature reviews and reading of other uh, subjects that you've already completed. Think about your professional goals. Uh, all of those, somewhere there should be something that you can get a purchase on and you can start to develop. Show me what you've got. Uh, January 29th and get it to me and, and let me take a look and I'll get back to you individually, uh, person by person, uh, through this uh, semester, uh, through the next semester's uh, uh, lecture, which will be next Thursday. Thanks very much for your time. Uh, I uh, appreciate you uh, watching this video in its entirety. I really appreciate the effort that you're going to be putting into this class. And um, I hope that you will enjoy the process of seeing it all come to fruition by the end of the semester in just a few short months. Thank you for your time, and I hope to see you uh, next Thursday or to see you in communication asynchronously otherwise. Thank you.